Welcome to the Model Health Show. This is fitness and nutrition expert Sean Stevenson, and I'm so grateful for you tuning in with me today. I just got word that they're possibly making a new Matrix movie. All right, the Matrix changed everything for me. And I remember at the time when the first Matrix came out, Keanu Reeves, Lawrence Fishburne, all right, Carrie Ann Moss. When that, when that movie first came out, I was working at the front desk at the Ramada, all right? I was at the Ramada, I was in college, and I was working part-time at the Ramada Hotel, and I was the, quote, front desk manager. Everywhere I go, I find myself being the leader of something, right? And, but, it, you know, I had some, some issues about the way they was running the hotel. That's a whole nother story. Always wanted to innovate. But I remember there was a guy who would come in just about every week. You know, he traveled for business, and he would stay at the Ramada, and he... You know, we say hi, you know, just pass her by, give my man the key. Very low maintenance. He went to see The Matrix, and I was standing at the front desk. I didn't really have any intention on going to see the movie. My man stopped, and he looked at me in my eyes and my soul, and he said, you have to see that movie. It changed my life. You've never seen anything like it. And I'm just like, he must have had a cappuccino. I don't know. I thought maybe he was just ramped up on something like... I don't know, maybe he was doing some illegals. I don't know, but I never seen my man like that. And so I was like, we got to go check this movie out. So I went to see it, and I got it. That movie changed the way that movies are made, but it also brought forth a really powerful perception about reality in and of itself and the fact that we can be trapped inside of our vision or definition of what we think reality is. And the, re the, the reality of the reality is that sometimes that can be a beautiful trapping, you know, uh, there's a statement that ignorance is bliss, right? But at the end of the day, as we're learning more about human anatomy and physiology and biology and the universe itself, and the ve I just saw something the other day that really baked my noodle on how many galaxies there are, right? There are literally billions upon billions upon billions of other planets. And we, all we know, we're still trying to figure out stuff here without messing ourselves up, right? There's so much more to learn. And so this is why I make it a mandate to bring on multiple perspectives, to bring on conversations and researchers, leaders in their field who think differently about certain subject matters. And today we have somebody who thinks differently about food, right? And so we've had on some of the top experts uh, with, with, a, with a more omnivorous perspective, with a vegan perspective, with a paleo perspective, with the ketogenic perspective, Mediterranean diet, the list goes on and on. There's so many different diet approaches. Today, we're gonna be talking about the carnivore diet, all right? And so again, I just want you to come into this with an open mind, possibly free your mind, and consider some of these aspects because they're, it's really fascinating when you think about some of these different insights as, that he's going to be sharing. Do I share complete uh, perspective that he does? Absolutely not. And I would encourage all of us to maintain our own perspectives and to think critically about things, especially when it comes to diet and nutrition, because this is the stuff we're choosing to make our bodies out of. There's nothing more powerful and valuable in the universe than that. And so we do want to keep an open mind and try to do our best when it comes to that topic and our choices. And so again, I'm really pumped to bring this perspective to you today. And also, you know what? Something that we immediately agree on in the health space is that we all need to move our bodies, all right? We all need exercise. The human body is designed to move. And over the last few years, there's been a big shift in the way that we're even talking about exercise and movement. I was a personal trainer for about 10 years. And through that process, I came into the game on some other level stuff just because of my exposure, right? I was working with a guy who was uh, this uh, award-winning um, bodybuilding type guy, right? And he knew all these little tips and tricks and insights and, you know, quote, natural bodybuilder, which I don't know. I mean, he was pretty cock diesel. He worked at another job with me, funny enough, that was across the street from the Ramada. It was the casino, all right? So the casino was working at. But anyways, um, and learning from him about superset training, right? About high-intensity training 
for weight with weights, right? Different things that I had never considered before. And so I came into the game on another level, but I kept an open mind. And so planks are like just in everybody's mental Rolodex today. We're doing this, you know, about 20 years ago, right? Working on uh, these various muscles and, and formations and ways of training that we heretofore just really haven't talked about in popular culture. And today we're moving from not just a weightlifting paradigm, which we know we need, not an aerobic paradigm, which we know we need a little bit of that. Oh, and we could see that through high intensity interval training, which has become hot. What we need is functional training, right? Things that actually translate over into the real world. That's what we would have done as we evolved, right? We're not, you know, our, uh, a million years ago, our ancestors weren't like doing a CrossFit workout with like deadlifting a boulder and then like throwing a spear you know, at a woolly man. We didn't have that, right? You're just moving to survive and to procure food and to create shelter and community, right? But today we go into the gym, we try to replicate what we really need. And it's great, these push-pull motions, we can get uh, growth hormone production, we can get stronger, you know, we can improve our insulin sensitivity, it's great benefits. But when we move with a purpose, when we move in a more what's we're calling functional whatever but i even that word i don't think it really even fits but just moving our body in creative ways that's where we're at today right and ways that translate over more into the real world and this is why i'm such a huge fan of on it this is the company the brand who really pushed functional training into popular culture right so they're the ones who really popularized um steel maces and steel clubs which i have all of these tools, uh, the battle ropes, right? I had never seen battle ropes at the gym, which there are many gyms that have them now. On it was carrying this stuff really, really early on. This is a company that's dedicated to the nutrition side and the fitness side. That's why I love those guys. And so I've got the steel clubs, steel maces, these tools. I've got the battle ropes. I've got the primal kettlebells, the ones that you see even, you know, the rock using, right? This big gorilla uh, and they've got these cool Marvel kettlebells when they have them in stock, Star Wars kettlebells, all these cool designs and taking it from just a, you know, kettlebell, which looks pretty cool, but just something that like, I, I love picking this tool up. And here's the great thing. Early on, they didn't offer this for anybody. I talked to them and I was like, listen, we can't just do 10% off for our nutrition and for the foods. We need it for the fitness equipment too. And they agreed. And so now you can get 10% off all of the fitness equipment at Onnit as well, in addition to the supplements and the foods. All right, so pop over there right now. Check them out. It's onnit.com forward slash model. Get 10% off every single thing they carry. That's O-N-N-I-T dot com forward slash model for 10% off. And now let's get to the Apple Podcast Review of the Week. Another five-star review titled Great Content with a Variety of Views by SM Pipad. Hey, Sean, my name is Brooke. I have my master's in dietetics. I love your show. It has a variety of views. It talks about the nerdy science stuff, but it's simple enough for everyone to understand. I learn something new every time I listen. Awesome. This is such a great review. It's so appropriate. For today this just lit me up to see this one and i appreciate that so very much and that's what we really strive to do here on the show and again thank you so much for taking the time to leave me that review over on apple Podcasts. and if you've yet to do so please pop over to apple Podcasts and leave a review for the show it means so much and uh, i just appreciate it immensely and on that note let's get to our special guest and topic of the day our guest today is dr paul saladino and he is leading authority on the science and application of the carnivore diet. He's used his diet to reverse autoimmunity, chronic inflammation, and mental health issues in hundreds of patients, personally, and many of whom had been told that their conditions were untreatable. In addition to his personal podcast that he has right now, it's called Fundamental Health. He's a featured contributor for Psychology Today, and his book, The Carnivore Code, Unlocking the Secrets to Optimal Health, by returning to our ancestral diet will be released coming up very, very soon. So keep an eye out for that. And when he's not researching connections between nutritional biochemistry and chronic disease, he can be found in the ocean searching for the perfect wave, cultivating mindfulness or spending time with his friends and family. And we're going to jump into this conversation with Dr. Paul Saladino. 
I just saw a great post. It was from Jason Weaver. Uh -huh. Now, that may, name might not sound familiar to you, but there are some people who are like, um, they saw the, the Jackson's TV special, which seemed to be repetitively on TV all the time. He played young Michael Jackson. He played on a television show, and he also had some R&B and like hip hop, because he's a singer, but he would like sing on a song with like Chingy or something. But here's the thing, the big claim to fame for him that most people don't know, he was the voice of Simba in The Lion King, the original movie. All right. Right, the cartoon. Uh -huh. And so his mom, they and like they were still, they, they were just kind of getting by, you know? Like they were just starting to get a little bit of traction with his career. Disney offered him $2 million. And he was just a kid, really. Like maybe he was, in, you know, 14 years old or something. And at first, like they're celebrating, jumping around the house. And then his mom, it took a little while, but she was like, wait a minute, why do they want to give us $2 million, right? There's something bigger here. And so what his mom intelligently did, which is like really difficult to do, is say, wait a minute, we want some of the overall. Yes. Right? And they end up getting maybe $100,000 and like back end. So he's still getting paid. On The Lion King. On The Lion King. Which is probably one of the most successful movies. He's made well over $2 million from it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So it's just thinking in those terms yeah. and thinking outside the box. And that's something that you're doing. And you got this new book coming out. Yep. And I know it's been, listen, I know that writing a health book might not be great for your health. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I try though, man. One of the things, so I grew up with a dad who's a doctor. Mm. And so I saw from an early age, a discordance between lifestyle and intention and lifestyle and practice, right? Yeah. My dad is one of my idols. Like, I, you know, maybe he'll listen to this podcast, maybe not, but I hope he does. I'm sure he'll read my book. And in the book, I kind of tell him, you know, hey, dad, you know, I'm proud to be your son and you mean a lot, you know, it's really cool to have been that way. But one of the hard things for my dad was that he was an internist, super smart guy, yeah. worked his butt off, worked his butt off and became unhealthy working his butt off doing that. From my earliest adult days, I have never wanted to do that. I've never believed in doing that and I've never been willing to do that. So throughout everything, I've always kind of felt I need to keep the balance. I yeah. have to keep the balance. And I actually feel that as humans, I'm a better creative person when I'm doing the things I like to do, when I'm passionate. If I'm not surfing and working out, my brain is not going to work as well. Mm. And as an entrepreneur, yeah. as a budding entrepreneur, it's been a fun process to learn that and to realize like, whoa, this is endless work. Like I could work all day, all night, seven days a week and push things forward. But I'm going to be, it's not about that anymore. It's about thinking clearly and creating the best quality content that I yeah. can on podcasts with my book, not the most content, just the most quality content. And it, to, in order to create the most quality content, I have to go surf. Yeah. Oh, I love that so much. And that's really today. We need that. There's such a, uh, just a massive amount of content out there, but we need it's good noise. content. It's noise. Right? Right. There's people so much People thinking noise. like you are. I yeah. love that, man. There's so much noise out there. And so to ask the question of like, what got you interested in health? I think I just got the answer already. It's probably just being around your dad. I think that, I mean... I was fortunate to grow up in a medical household. That's a fascinating question. What makes us healthy? What makes us sick? Yeah. Everybody wants to be healthy. Everybody wants to feel good, you know? Like, I think everybody, I hope everybody listening to this has had at least some point in their life where they felt good. Yeah. Not everybody listening to this feels good now, but a lot of people have felt good at one point. And they either felt good doing gymnastics or playing water polo or playing golf or playing cricket or baseball or whatever they did in their life. They felt good on the beach with their family. They had these moments that were just diamond where they were clear headed. Their mood was good. They were happy with their body. They had libido, they had energy and they were sleeping well. And like, that's, that's, that's what it's about, right? Like we're not here for a long time, so we might as well have a good quality of life. So that's what mm. I think I became fascinated with that very early in my life. How do I get more of that? And how do I help other people do that more too? Like, what a fascinating question. Like, the quality of life, it sounds trite, but man, that's what we're all after. And so that has been a question I've been iterating in my mind for decades, mm, you know? Yeah. How, what makes people unwell? I remember asking my dad that when I was probably 13 years old. That's a big question. What causes heart disease? That That's always been kind of the first one that fascinated me. Yeah. What causes atherosclerosis? Right, right. What causes What it? causes it, Dad? You know, and we can get into it, you know, yeah. for sure. But he was like, nobody knows. Yeah, I was, I was just going to say, well, I bet I know what his response was. He said, nobody knows. That was 30 years ago. Yeah. Now I, we pretty much know, yeah. you know, I, it's debated and it's, yeah. people don't agree on all of it yeah. and the nuance, but I, I want to know because I don't want heart disease, right? Yeah. I don't want to have a heart attack. Yeah. 
I don't want to have a stroke. I don't want to have diabetes. How do I avoid those things? I want my back to work so I can jump and do back bends and surf, you know, and all these things. Yeah, absolutely, man. And this just remind me of a line from Drake. He said, I'm here for a good time, not a long time, uh -huh. you know, and just like looking at our, our lifespan as human beings. And I just, you know, recently had a conversation with Dr. David Sinclair, right. who we'll probably bring up here at some point. Yeah, we should. And understanding like the, the right now it's very finite, you know, like we're looking at ways to extend our lifespan, our health span, but we, a big part of this and what I hear you saying is like, it's enjoying the process. And part of that obviously is, is uh, cultivating good health. And a part of that is our mental health. And also we're gonna talk today about how our diet can affect that, which we'll get to in a moment. But I'm wondering for you, you know, and so much has changed, like you said, in the last 30 years, I remember not being able to really even say that there was a cure for type two diabetes, for example. Mm -hmm. but this is something that can literally be turned on and turned off. And the science is pretty clear now, but what we've learned in the last few decades is just absolutely incredible but you're coming from a place where you were in a conventionally driven mental perspective and you took a pivot along the way and you realize that food has a lot to do with our health which is very challenging and all of the friends that i have who are physicians me going pre-med and and looking at i was immediately taught pharmacology right, right. But you gave this really powerful insight that food, if you look at the measure of food, and I want you to break this down, the measure of food versus the measure of a drug we might take, it doesn't even compare. This food matters a lot. Food matters a ton. And you've hit on perhaps one of the most important points. When Western medicine realizes this, the paradigm will shift. And the, the simple fact of the matter is that there is no bigger lever for health and disease than food. And all discussions of whether you espouse a vegan diet or whether anyone espouses a carnivore diet or a paleo diet or a keto diet, if Western medicine opens its mind just a hair to the possibility that food could influence disease and that food is the driver, then the amount of research that will come out of that will change the world. Mm. Because that is the research that's not being done. So many people with inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, or irritable bowel syndrome, or other autoimmune conditions, thyroid disease, whatever, are going to their doctors and asking the question, does food have anything to do with my Hashimoto's? Does food have anything to do with my ulcerative colitis? Does food have anything to do with my eczema? Does food have anything to do with my, what's another good example, rheumatoid arthritis? And 98% of the time, they're getting the answer, no. Yeah. And that is wrong. That is 100% wrong, because food is the lever. And you know, my, I realized that pretty early. I, I realized that what I ate influenced the way that I was going to feel. And this probably came from my early athletic endeavors. I never had an, a very illustrious athletic career, but I was an athlete and I ran. The first thing I did was running and distance running. Eventually I did ultra marathon distance running and have since become a little more sane in the mind in wow. terms of my activities. But, you know, as an athlete, any athlete is going to realize that the food they eat influences the way they perform. That's the first thing. But Western medicine has forgotten that. And I say forgotten because we, we used to know that. But yeah. in the last 100 years, the pharmaceutical model has really taken over. And what we're taught in medical school is how to diagnose a disease and then which pill to give for that disease. Yeah. We're never taught to ask the question, what causes this disease? What caused that? If, if we started asking that question, people would have crises of faith because they would come up with, we don't know, often and the awesome part about that is that when you get that answer, we don't know, I don't know, you start looking into it. You start thinking, well, what do I, how am I going to move through this? How am I going to move past this problem yeah. and actually understand what might be causing this disease? But when Western medicine realizes that food is the answer to that, then we can get the studies we need that can help us decide, you know, is it meat? Is meat really bad for us? Are vegetables really good for us? You know, yeah. what could vegetables be harming people? You know, the, um, I'm a, huge believer in a carnivore diet. And so a lot of the things I believe are heretical, but in my mind, plants are a big part of the problem, but we'll get into that. Yeah, absolutely. So I want to ask you the example that I heard you say had to do with, and it's just like hit me like a ton of bricks and I've thought about it, but in a different color, like in a right. different context, right. but drugs and food, they're oh, yeah. both molecules, right? But we're eating massively more amounts of these molecules from our food. Kilogram quantities of molecules in food and microgram or milligram quantities in, 
in drugs. And we know that I can give someone 200 milligrams of metoprolol and basically cause them to pass out because their heart will go so slow or their blood pressure will drop so lowly. And, you know, our molecules are what we're made out of at some level, right? We can you know, do the full spectrum of magnification from quantum physics to macro level biology, but at some level, molecules are interacting with humans and they're touching receptors and signaling cascades. And our food is a uh, 10 to 1,000 times greater signal to our bodies in a molecular fashion, in exactly the same fashion a drug would be. Mm, right, man. And just putting in that perspective, just like really lit me up. And um, again, like, and this is the thing that I, I love about your approach too, is that there are many different pieces of this equation that we're all figuring out. And there's a lot of stuff that's still on the table. Yeah. You know, drugs do stuff. They do. But food, man, it, it does stuff too, but food we've overlooked stuff. it long enough. Food does stuff. And by the same token, as we'll get into, molecules in plants do stuff. You know, and molecules in, in meat and animal foods do stuff. And there are plant toxins. And so that's kind of a, we'll talk about that too. But there are, we've gotten so many drugs from plants, you know. There are so many molecules in plants that are totally toxic for humans. But that's the same equation, you know. Yeah. Plants do stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the people that really sparked me to just be like, I've, I've got to talk to him was Mark Bell. Uh -huh. I talked to him a little while ago. And he's just, and it's, it's, he's crushing it, you know, and he's doing the carnivore diet. And I wanted to look for a little bit more information, more clarity on it. And, you know, people kept pointing me to you. And so one of the things that I first heard you say was that the carnivore diet isn't a meat-based diet. It's an animal-based diet. So let's talk about that distinction. Yeah. So imagine that you and I are in a tribe, you know? You seem like an awesome guy. I'd love to be in your tribe, right? Let's go hunt because that's how we're going to get our food. That's how we're going to get probably the best food that we can get. So we're out on the plains in Africa hunting a gazelle, or maybe we're after something even bigger. You know, maybe we're after an elephant, you know, 300,000 years ago when there's not, they're not going extinct, you know, and we can, you know, humans could have hunted elephants. And say we have a tribe and we bring down an elephant or a gazelle or a large animal. We're not just going to, you know, eat like the, the ribeye. You know, we're not just going to eat an elephant tenderloin or a woolly mammoth tenderloin. We're going to eat the whole animal and because it's calories. And the, what happens accidentally, probably from an evolutionary perspective, is we get nutrients from all these different parts of the animal. There are different nutrients in different compartments of the animal. Our muscles have different physiology than our liver than our kidney, than our spleen, than our brain, than, you know, any piece of your body, than your blood. And so our body uses nutrients differently throughout the body. So a muscle, piece of muscle meat, like a steak, is not the same nutritional content as liver or kidney. Right. And so our ancestors have always known this. They eat the whole animal. And if you actually look at the way that indigenous people generally eat animals or carnivorous animals eat other animals, they often go for the organs and fat first. Uh, one of my good friends, Mike Mutzel, has a podcast you might know about high intensity health in um, uh, Seattle. And he has chickens. And, you know, he lost a couple of chickens to raccoons, but he said something that was really striking for me. He said the raccoons only ate the stomachs of the chickens. They didn't eat the chicken breasts or the chicken thighs or, you know, these are wild chickens, so they yeah. don't have these huge breasts like yeah. factory farm chickens do. But Breastuses. Breastuses. <laughs> <laughs> but, the, you know, the raccoons ate the abdominal organs. Yeah. And you'll hear these indigenous accounts of, uh, you know, we hunt an animal. The first thing that we've traditionally done in our tribe is eat the liver raw. And it's savored. Everyone gets a little piece. It's like it's sacred because they knew that if they did not eat the liver, eventually they would develop nutritional deficiencies or right. something would happen. Right. And you can eat a lot of meat on an animal-based diet, but you to be ancestrally consistent, to be nutritionally complete, to really kick a lot of butt, the organs are where it's at. And combining them is an evolutionarily consistent behavior. So yeah. it's an animal-based diet. Yeah, and we've definitely um, moved away from that oh, in yes. recent decades, oh, for yes. sure. You know, and to the degree that even the idea of eating a heart or a you know liver or brain or anything like that is just like so far off of our radar but again like looking back on the way that we traditionally ate animals that we would hunt yeah this is a huge part because i think that one of the things i'm, I'm hearing you allude to is that you can because for me immediately I'm like well what about these certain nutrients 
And you're saying that these are potentially the most nutrient dense foods, period, you know, in taking into consideration plants as well. Is that? Is that Absolutely. The idea of nutrient density is a little bit misguided, but nutrient availability and nutrient richness, you know, density is a, is a, is a, is a weight per volume measure, right? Yeah, so right. if you're talking about nutrient density, the arguments always end up that a, a multivitamin is the most nutrient dense thing on the planet because you can get all these nutrients in a very small pill. But yeah. a better measure is taking into account bioavailability and nutrient richness or the amount of yeah. nutrients that occur. So it's, it's a multifactorial equation. It's, it's not just, it doesn't have a single variable. The first variable is how much of a nutrient is present in a food. And the second variable is how much of that nutrient can we get out of it? Right. And the third variable is, are there things in that food that prevent us absorbing the nutrient, which is kind of tied into that second variable? How much can we get out of it? So when you're thinking about it that way, gosh, you can make a really strong argument. It's basically an open and shut case that animal foods are the most nutrient-rich foods on the planet and the most nutrient bioavailable foods on the planet. They're just, we get so many of the nutrients. The corollary to that is also that there are numerous nutrients in animal foods that we know humans need to thrive that do not occur in the plant kingdom. Mm -hmm. And the reverse is not true. Things like carnitine, creatine, choline, vitamin K2, there, B12. B12, exactly. There are so many of these. And many of those we can make very small quantities of in our bodies. But to get enough, we have to eat animal foods. It just doesn't work any other way. And there are plenty of studies with vegetarians or plant-based eaters showing that, unfortunately, they have lower levels of those things and function less optimally because of that. Mm, fascinating. That's so fascinating. Yeah, you, we don't typically talk about the reverse, you know. And uh, this is why... With the Model Health Show, we really strive to bring on the best people in their respective fields, you know, because there is this other extreme end of the equation where folks are vegan. Right. And then we move to this side. I didn't know there was this side of the equation yeah. <laughs> until recently where we're just saying carnivore diet specifically. And so a lot of questions come up for me because when we're looking at the vegan side of the equation, we know that there are a lot of nutrient holes that right. we can fill through you know, supplementation or whatever the case might be to sustain that lifestyle. Things that are very important. With a completely animal-based diet, I don't, nothing really comes to mind except maybe, what about vitamin C? We example? can talk about it, yeah. yeah. So I did a podcast with Chris Masterjohn on my podcast, which is Fundamental Health, a couple weeks ago. Uh, Chris is a pretty well-known a uh, PhD scientist in the nutritional world. And he doesn't believe in, an, in a carnivore diet per se, but we had a long conversation about what nutritional deficiencies there might be on a carnivore diet. That's one of the first things I thought yeah. when I looked into this. And what you find is you there's nothing missing. Yeah. And, and when you eat it intentionally, right? Mm -hmm. When you eat it intentionally, if you just eat muscle meat, and this is what Chris yeah. and I talked about, we can, there you can definitely have nutritional deficiencies, right? Folate, biotin, uh, riboflavin, many nutrients can be inadequately represented in the muscle meat, but they're at it. They're just robustly present in liver, kidney, and the organs. It quickly completes the picture. There's also conversations about amino acid balance, methionine, and glycine. Really, the conversation often comes back to vitamin C about this. And this is so fascinating. It's a little bit of revisionist history here because we've been told that we need tons of vitamin C to be healthy. But if you look at the scientific literature, when we give people vitamin C supplements, we don't see improvements. People who have higher levels of vitamin C in their blood tend to do better, but those are epidemiology studies. Mm. And the problem with epidemiology studies is they can so often be confounded by healthy user bias and other problems. People that have higher levels of vitamin C are likely to be doing other healthy behaviors, which may actually be accounting. So when we give people extra vitamin C, it doesn't seem to help them. If you actually look at what vitamin C does in our body, it's involved in a few oxidation reduction reactions. It's in the aqueous compartment of the cell and helps to regenerate glutathione, which is one of the major uh, oxidative reductive sort of players in our cells. But the question is, how much do we really need? Because vitamin C actually does occur in animal foods. And there's, it's never been really talked about. But mm. if you look at meat, if you just go to your phone or your computer and Google, like how much vitamin C is in meat, it'll say zero. But that's wrong. If you look at actual databases, and there's been multiple studies that show this, the amount of vitamin C in muscle meat alone is between 10 and 15 milligrams per pound. People might say, oh, 10 to 15 milligrams, that's nothing. I need 1,000. But then we have to call into the question the studies that say, 
why would you need a thousand milligrams of vitamin C? You know, can we actually show any clinical benefit? And you cannot. So if you look at how much vitamin C humans need, the best metric is going to be, are they having oxidative stress? Are they having scurvy, which is the most uh, blatant sort of manifestation clinically of vitamin C deficiency? And then are they showing oxidative stress? And there's some fascinating studies from the 1930s and 40s that they did with people in concentration camps. And they actually gave them scurvy. Actually, not concentration camps. These were conscientious objectors to the war. And they mm. were subjected to this experiment that would never have happened now. But mm. they gave them scurvy. And it took between four and six weeks in most people to get scurvy. And then they looked to see how much vitamin C they needed to reverse the scurvy. The lowest dose they gave was 10 milligrams, and it completely reversed scurvy. Mm. So 10 milligrams a day is enough to prevent scurvy. They didn't actually do lower doses. We don't know. It could have been five or three. But if you are eating an animal-based diet, you will absolutely get 10 milligrams of vitamin C a day. You know, there's yeah. no question. Then the question becomes, is there a benefit to getting a little more vitamin C than that? And the discussion gets a little granular. But at a clinical level, what I've done in my practice and what we can do now is say, if you were not getting enough vitamin C, what would we see? And we would see oxidative stress. And we don't see that right? Yeah. You can check measures that are a little esoteric, but things like 8-hydroxy, 2-deoxy guanosine, which is DNA damage, or lipid peroxides. You can check glutathione levels. You can look at oxidized and reduced levels of glutathione, and they, they all look fine in the carnivores that I work with and that have been studied. And of course, this is all in its infancy. But it, it appears that humans don't need more vitamin C than you can gut eating animal foods nose to tail. And that kind of makes sense evolutionarily, right? Mm. Yeah. The last thing I'll add to that, the RDA right now for vitamin C is 60 milligrams, 60 milligrams for women, I think, and 80 or 90 for men. And you can easily get to 60 milligrams a day eating animal foods nose to tail. Liver is more rich in vitamin C than muscle meat. So the Inuit, for instance, they, they average probably 40 milligrams of vitamin C a day, and they don't seem to have scurvy or oxidative stress, at least clinically when we can see it. So getting to 40 to 50 milligrams of vitamin C a day with animal foods is totally doable. And then the discussions get a little granular from there. But there's there seems to be plenty. Yeah, man, this is fascinating. I haven't taken a vitamin C supplement in over a year, and I don't have any scurvy. So. <laughs> <laughs> My teeth are all just fine. Yeah. They're not I, falling out. Of course, I immediately think of pirates every time I hear scurvy. You right. Know? And so the thing, the difference there is you cannot eat spam, right? You cannot eat preserved meat. You mm. have to eat fresh meat. Fresh meat is known to be an antiscorbutic. And there are cases of people eating just spam, and you will get scurvy because that, the, probably the, the salting process of the meat and the preservation process destroys the ascorbic acid. But if you're eating fresh meat, you, you will not get scurvy, and there's no need. The other thing I would say is if people are worried, it's not the worst thing in the world to add a little bit of a vitamin C supplement, though I have not seen clinical evidence that we need it. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Um, you know what I really enjoyed about just looking into you and your work is that with a subject matter like this that's so counterculture, which is so crazy, it's just like a few years back, it was veganism and people are just like, well, how do you get your protein or whatever? And the people right. are quizzing it's, and you got to be on the defense. Right. You're not somebody who's approaching things from a defensive place. Like you're off, being on offense and like, let me, let me talk about some of the studies and the research and and how all this stuff is actually working, yeah. but in a way that makes sense, yeah. you know? And so I really enjoy that about you. Thank you. And with that said, you know, I do have some uh, more defensive, Ooh. like, <laughs> questions. Hit me. Because for me, it's, uh, like I said, it's very counterculture, uh -huh. but there inherently, and just from our past episodes, there's so much value in what you're saying and just painting a bigger picture for right. people. And so for me, I'm thinking about, like, one of the other things that would come up and just to help us to elaborate and think think a little bit differently about the situation, one of the first things I think about in terms of plants is that humans are naturally omnivores. Right. Right? We're, we're hunter-gatherers. What about the gather part? Right. And so you're saying, well, we don't actually need the gathering part. That's more so if, like, there's nothing to hunt around. Is That's that right? exactly it. Mm -hmm. um, people will often say that to me. They'll say, but humans are omnivores. And I got, that's a little circular logic. Like, what's an omnivore, right? Like, you can get into all these kind of rabbit hole discussions about the human mouth and the human gut and all these things, and they don't really lead you anywhere useful from an anthropologic perspective. 
I think that, you know, the, the omnivore carnivore distinction is much more gray than people believe it is. For instance, we might consider wolves and dogs to be omnivores, or maybe we'd consider them to be carnivores. You know, wolves don't eat a lot of plant matter in, you know, in, uh, in the wild. But if you feed a dog a kibble cereal, you're probably going to give it cancer long term, but it's not going to die tomorrow, right? And he'll eat it. He'll eat it, right? Does that mean it's a carnivore or an omnivore, right? So it's kind of a misleading distinction. It's the question, the more interesting questions for me is which diet is going to create the best health for any individual. And there may be some variation between individuals, and we can talk about that as well. I do think that throughout evolution, humans have eaten plants, but you hit on this point perfectly. Again, we can never know this, but if we look at the paleoanthropologic record, there's a pretty convincing story that it was the hunting of animals and the consumption of animals that made us human, that allowed our brains to grow. If we look at the size of the human brain, for instance, right? So I was just listening, just listening to this great podcast with Bill Von Hippel on the way up here. Um, he, uh, he's a, sort of a, a, an anthropologic uh, guy as well, and he wrote a book called The Social Leap, I believe. It's a really good book. But so humans diverged from apes six million years ago. There was a change in the Rift Valley in Africa, and we kind of were forced out, out onto the savannas. And we can see from the size of skulls how big our brains were. And we know that primate evolution preceded human evolution for 30 million years. And the size of primate brains, is it stayed common, it stayed consistent. You know, monkeys, primates, eating vegetable, primarily plant-based diets, had the same size brain for 30 million years. When we moved out of the savannah, we were out of the trees into the savannah, we were forced to start eating animals a little bit. And our brains started to grow a little bit. And then about 2.5 million years ago, after Australopithecus, Homo erectus, Homo habilis showed up, showed up and looking at the size of the cranium, we see a sudden inflection point and we get really a much bigger brain, much faster. So we go from 400 CC to maybe 950 CC. We double in size over the course of a million years when three, 30 million years before that, we, we weren't even, it didn't even budge, right? So we doubled our brain size and then we doubled it again in the next 500,000 years. It just gets to be logarithmic. And if you look at the anthropologic record, it's clear that we were hunting animals then. That was when we started hunting animals. We, you can see stone tools. You can see nicks on the bone where we would have used sharpened stone tools to carve the meat off the animals. And so from a, a historical evolutionary perspective, it's very clear that humans ate animals at this key point in our evolution to become human, quote unquote. But one of the probably, but we came from people that we came from a lineage that was eating plants, right? So we kept some of the ability to digest plants, which probably was an evolutionary benefit because we're not always going to be able to have a successful hunt. If you and I are hunting and we don't get an animal, well, okay, let's go gather, right? Let's get some calories till tomorrow, but, and then we'll hunt again. Okay. So we're going to eat some plants, but I think it makes a lot of sense. And there is evidence um, from numerous directions pointing to the fact that these foods were probably just fallback foods. You know, they're, they're secondary. They're just survival foods. If we can dig up a tuber, then we can get enough calories to get till tomorrow. And then you and I can go hunt an elephant again. And there are so many lines that would point in that direction. The, the nutritional content, we know we can't just survive on tubers forever. We have to hunt again. We know what happens if we just eat a vegan diet, right? Because if people could just gather, we would, you and I just would be like, Hey man, let's just go let's just go dig tubers forever, you know, and then I'm not risking my life with a saber tooth tiger getting trampled by this elephant or let's go, let's go just eat some roots and, and stems and leaves. But I think humans figured out pretty quickly that stuff doesn't taste good. It's not that nutritive. It, it might get us till tomorrow. It might just give us enough calories, but it's just a fallback food. And so I think having the ability to do both allowed us to get through the lean times, but there are some fascinating studies of bones from Neanderthal and Homo sapiens from 80,000 years ago in Europe. And you can look at the collagen in the bones and you can look at the carbon content and the actual stable carbon and nitrogen isotopes in the bone and get a sense of where on the trophic level mm -hmm. people were getting their protein from. And invariably, the bones showed that we had higher amounts of stable nitrogen and carbon than known carnivores at the time, suggesting that we were eating the majority of our diet from animals 80,000 years ago, right? Yeah. Hunting. So you can look at hyenas and how much, how much stable nitrogen isotope they have in their bones. 
And we had more than that. So we were eating more and bigger animals than they were. And if we'd gotten any significant amount of protein from plants, that would have declined, resulted in a decline in our stable nitrogen levels. So I think that humans have eaten plants, but like you said, they've been survival foods and the animals are where we get all the nutrients from. Mm, interesting. Survival foods. Um, and this brings me back to uh, somebody we talked about before the show, yeah. Daniel Vitalis. Oh, yeah. And he's he, he coined the term survival. Right. Right. And so he's another one of those cases. And, you know, um, for me personally and working in this field for, it's getting close to 20 years now, you know, about 18 years, and seeing so many cases of folks who, because you you mentioned this in passing, but who take on a vegan diet and it generally lasts within, we'll say, five years is like the max for most people. Now, of course, we have many awesome vegans who listen to the show and there are these, and I'm just going to ask you, are these anomalies for folks that have been vegan for 20 years, 25, 30 years? You know, you you kind of touched on this earlier and I want to stay open-minded and, and appreciate people where they are. I think that Anytime someone makes a conscious choice for diet, they're doing the right thing. Like if you're if you're thinking about what you're eating, whether you're choosing to eat a vegan diet or a carnivore diet, you're on the right path, right? Yeah. I just want the people that choose to eat a plant-based diet to be aware that nutritional deficiencies may develop and the toxins in plants have been shown to trigger inflammation and issues in the gut and could activate the immune system. I did a podcast a few months ago with Rich Roll. Um, super nice guy yeah. here in LA on the minimalists and you know, rich, rich is thriving on a vegan diet. My question is always how much more, butt could he kick eating higher quality foods? Mm, right. Interesting. You know, so there's a couple of questions tied up in this, right? If people are listening to this and they're doing great on a vegan diet, who am I to tell them how to change? You know, if they're having a high quality of life, then that's awesome. You know, I'm so happy for them. And in the back of my mind, I always think like, what if they could be better with higher nutrients, you know? And, and I just want to make sure they're looking at the nutrients that they might be missing and being aware that the, the, the plant foods might be triggering immunologic reactions. But um, I think that for a lot of people who are eating a lot of plants, they would feel even better eating animals. Um, but I do think, and this brings up a very important point, I do think there is genetic variability in our ability to tolerate plants. Some people, like Rich, can tolerate plants and do pretty good. I think Rich would be a freaking animal if he ate animal, you know, like he would be a Terminator uh, if, he, if we got some steak into him, but, and some liver. But, you know, there are definitely some people that I see in the community that I've encountered clinically who they eat plants and they get rheumatoid arthritis, you know, or they get profound problems. I had eczema, right? Or Hashimoto's thyroiditis or, you know, ulcerative colitis. So within the spectrum of omnivory, carnivory, I believe that humans fundamentally are built to be hunters, that our biology, our biochemistry is built to use animal foods as the primary fuel. And I think basically everybody is like that. I don't think our biology has diverged and that somewhere along the evolutionary tree, there was this major branch point and a whole group of people it's just, you know, their biology changed so much that it was like, you know what, we're going to do plants. Like we're just going to be a plant-based people. Like, I don't think that ever happened because I think that humans have been eating the majority of their food as animals, as much as they could get them for our entire evolution. And it's only within the last 10 to 12,000 years that we started doing farming and agrarianism. And we know that human health declined radically when that happened. And so that's too short a time. And there haven't really been selective pressures to say like, oh, you're a race now of plant eating people. So I think that every human on the planet is really built to eat animal foods and on top of that, some people have the ability to tolerate more plant foods. Maybe they can extract more of the vitamins and minerals from plant foods. There are polymorphisms in, en in enzymes like BCMO, which has to do with uh, breaking down beta carotene into vitamin A, which might allow someone to get more you know, vitamin A from plants. But other people can't really get that vitamin A from plants, and they need preformed vitamin A in animals. So there are lots of polymorphisms, or immunologically perhaps, they're less likely to be triggered by the toxic molecules in plants that cause harm for other people. So the people that are thriving on plant-based diets, that, that's great. I think they would do better on animal-based diets. And I think that there's a spectrum of how well we can tolerate plants. And that generally, everyone is going to do better by eating less plant toxins 
and getting more of the bioavailable nutrients. It's kind of that simple equation, less toxins, more nutrients, you thrive. Got it, yeah. So let's talk about some of those plant toxins yeah. specifically because in reference to my conversation with uh, Dr. Sinclair, right. who's just brilliant guy, living what he talks about, is doing amazing. Mm -hmm. He talks about uh, xenohormetic right. nature of plant foods right. and how important that is for basically giving us a little bit of a stressor to make us better. Right. And so I'm hearing that we don't, from you, we don't really need that stressor. But so where does that fall into line? What are some of these plant toxins that are actually more of a problem than a potential benefit? This is probably the, one of the most interesting and nuanced parts of this discussion that people find you know, the most challenging. The first question that you asked, or the first sort of statement you made there, I would agree with. We don't need plant molecules to give us a little, a little burst of stress, right? You can go for a run. You can be in the sun. You can jump in cold water. You can sauna. So I'm writing this book. It's called The Carnivore Code. It's going to be out in a few months, and I talk about this in the book. There are molecular hormetics, and there are environmental hormetics. And I think we must be very careful not to confuse the way that they act in our bodies because they're a little different and it's nuanced. Environmental hormetics are what we've always had, I believe. You know, you go in the sun, you get a little DNA damage in your skin and your body makes a little bit of glutathione or something to repair the DNA damage or it turns on the PARP enzymes to repair the DNA damage. So you're getting micro stressors just by living your life in a natural way. The problem is that we've been separated from that a lot. Right. It's coming back in with the biohacking space now. People are like, cold plunge. It's like, yeah, of course, cold plunge. We've been jumping in cold water for four million years. This reminds me of uh, something Daniel said, Daniel Vitalis. We've evolved, you know, from homo erectus, homo habilis, homo domesticus. Homo domesticus, right? homo yeah. fragilis. Yeah. Yeah. And we've, we're not in the sun enough. We don't experience heat stress. You know, uh, Rhonda Patrick's all about that. I still want to debate her. I respect her work, but I still want to debate her. Uh, you know, we can turn on heat shock proteins in a sauna like we would exercising on a hot day, right? You can jump in cold water and get cold stress. You can be, you know, you can do all kinds of things in your life that will affect your levels of glutathione and affect sort of your ability to strengthen or at least stress your antioxidant system. So we don't need plant compounds to do that. You can live what I would call a radical life, right? Kind of tongue in cheek. If you just do cool things in your life, you go surf in cold water, you run up mountains, you go in the sun, you go in a sauna, you do cold plunges, you do cryo, whatever you want to do, that, there's your hormetic stressor. That's our evolutionary hormetic stressor. The xenohormetic compounds are a little nuanced. So let's break this down because this is really important. Plant compounds, molecules in plants can activate antioxidant response elements in our body. They do this because they are a toxin, <laughs> okay? And this is, I'm sure that Dr. Sinclair, and he and I were talking actually before the podcast because I bumped into him outside. I'm sure he would agree with this. Like the things that we think of as xenohormetics are toxins. So the dose makes the poison is what people say about hormesis. If you give yourself a small amount of a molecule like sulforaphane, which is in broccoli sprouts, right? This is an isothiocyanate molecule it will activate the NRF2 system in the liver and the NRF2 system in the liver will say, okay, I need to make more glutathione. I'm going to turn on glutathione synthase, glutathione peroxidase, and you'll get more glutathione. Glutathione is the major cellular antioxidant currency in the body, okay? So you will increase your glutathione in the short term with an isothiocyanate like, uh, like um, uh, sulforaphane. But here's the rub, and this is what I think David is missing, and I'm going to have my podcast, and we'll talk about it. Because it's a xenohormetic, the xeno means foreign. The xeno means foreign molecule. This is an intruder. It's acting as a toxin in your body. It's not just going to NRF2 and turning it on and making glutathione. Isothiocyanates also act as toxins in other places in the body, and this is what people are missing with these plant compounds. Sure, there are some of these xenohormetics that will increase your glutathione in the short term, but we're never told about the fact that they do other damaging things in the body. This is what I call collateral damage because they're from a different operating system. The plant didn't make, uh, the plant didn't make this molecule. The plant doesn't make sulforaphane or an isothiocyanate to benefit you or me. Those are phytoalexins. They're plant defense molecules. 
Those are chemical spikes from plants that have been evolved over plants 400 million years to prevent animals from eating them. Those are plant defense molecules. Why would we think that a plant defense molecule would be good for us in the long run? We have to think about this in terms of the net benefit or loss. So what, what David would argue is that glutathione is increased by this molecule. And in the short term, it is. But number one, do we need more glutathione if we're living a radical life? And I think there are studies to say, no, we don't. And I'll tell you about those. It doesn't actually provide any benefit. And the second thing is that it's going to circulate in the body and do other damaging things that we're never told about. In the case of sulforaphane, it can inhibit the production of thyroid hormone by competing with iodine at the level of the thyroid. And as it circulates throughout our body, it's causing lipid peroxidation in our cell membranes. The reason it's turning on the antioxidant response system, the reason it's turning on NRF2 in the liver is because it's creating lipid peroxidation because it's an oxidative stressor. And so before the glutathione goes up, you get damage to your cell membranes from sulforaphane. And the, you, you see this in every single plant molecule. I talk about this in my book. Every single plant molecule I've looked at, we see the same pattern. Why would I take a molecule like this if I don't need it in the first place and it's going to damage me? That sounds like a net negative to me, right? We don't need those molecules to have enough glutathione, to have enough antioxidant system movement in our bodies. And the last thing I'll say, I know I've been rambling, <laughs> is when you actually oh, look at fruit and vegetable depletion studies, so they've done these studies in people. You can take away all of the fruits and vegetables from someone's diet. Most of them are about 24 days or six weeks. There's four or five of them I'm thinking of. So you can take two groups of people and one of them eats pounds of vegetables a day, like a pound and a half of fruit and vegetables a day, tons of polyphenols, tons of xenohormetic molecules. The other group, they take away all the fruits and vegetables. And they're just eating like meat and bread. They're not even eating a carnivore diet, right? They're eating just like worse than carnivore diet. I mean, way worse than a carnivore diet because I would say carnivore diet's amazing. But anyway, they're just eating like meat and bread, right? Meat and cake. And at the end of that study, they're going to compare these two. And you would think if those molecules, if polyphenols, if xenohormetic molecules like isocyocyanates, you know, which is different than a polyphenol, were actually benefiting humans... At the end of those four to six weeks, you would see a difference in glutathione or oxidative stress or immune response or inflammation, but you don't. Those groups are exactly the same at the end of four to six weeks. They look at markers like 8-hydroxy-2-deoxyguanosine, marker of DNA damage, or lipid peroxides, malondialdehyde, F2 isoprostanes, markers of inflammation, HSCRP, markers of immune activation, interleukin-6, TNF-alpha. They're the same between the two groups. So the, the case that's being made for these molecules as hormetics kind of falls flat. Like, where's the benefit, you know? And the thing they're not looking at is what about all the harm those things are causing? And there's, one of, there's actually a study that shows that in people who remove all those things, the oxidative stress markers get better. When you remove fruits and vegetables, that was an 11-week trial, the oxidative stress markers got better. How, I mean, just like tip the whole thing over on its head. This is fascinating. Um, I have so many questions that I'm here, have come man. up. And, you know, it's, it's just, again, changing our lens and how we're mm -hmm. looking at this. It was a great time and a great conversation. And it's really been pressed in, I guess, more of the public consciousness uh, through Dr. Gundry, who I know you know as well. Yeah. And uh, his conversation about lectins. But this is just, that's kind of like a blanket statement of right. all the different potential plant compounds that can be harmful for us. But my question immediately is, so meat doesn't have any of these? Meat. So, you know, an, different animal foods? They don't. I mean, you think about it from this perspective. How are plants defending themselves? They can't run away. They've had to evolve chemicals. You hunt a deer, it, it's way faster than you and me, right? An elephant's going to step on my head or mm. gore me with his tusk. It doesn't have to evolutionarily evolve a toxin in its muscle. There are a few animal foods you could point to, maybe like a puffer fish, right? It has a toxin, tetrodotoxin or something. But generally speaking, animals have claws, teeth, fangs, hooves, and motility, movement. That's their defense mechanism, right? Mm -hmm. But plants are just stuck in the ground. In my book, I say, what if I just take you to the beach and I just bury you up to your sand, at your neck in the sand? Remember like when you were a kid? But I'm going to bury you so tight that you can't move. You're stuck. You'll be like, oh, okay. Now I'm going to paint your face like a soccer ball. And have a bunch of six-year-old, <laughs> like a six-year-old birthday party around, hanging around, right? These six-year-olds are just like, 
Where's the ball? Oh, wow. You're going to feel like you're going to get kicked in the face, man. That's how a plant feels. You're going to feel vulnerable. A plant is rooted in the ground. It, there's, there's nothing it can do to prevent that, that deer, that moose from coming over and just taking a big bite out of it, you know? Take it, and it's got the only plants that have survived 400 million years of coevolution with animals are plants that have toxins. And so you, you can look at every single plant out there. It's got some phytoalexin or it has an actual spike like a rose bush, right? But for the most part, plants have toxins in them because they're just trying to survive. But animals just run away. And so generally speaking, there are none of these compounds in animal foods that are defense mechanisms against attack or predation. They're going to run away from you. And then there's a lot of nuanced discussions here. We yeah. can get into the cancer and all this other yeah. kind of stuff. Oh, but and that's exactly what I'm going to ask you about yeah. next. So I want to talk about the relationship between uh, animal foods and illness. And yeah. we're going to do that. And we're going to talk about fiber too, right yeah. after this quick break. So sit tight. and We'll be right back. Hey, everybody, with all of the things that we're exposed to today, the environmental toxicity, the weird stuff showing up in our food supply, we've got to do things to really support our immune system. Our immune system is really running the show on so many different levels to keep us healthy. And one of the most powerful things for supporting a healthy immune system is making sure that we're getting in some immunomodulators. So what does that mean? These are substances that can help to elevate our immune system in response to things that might be trying to creep their way into our body, into our cells, and defend us against those things. But it can also bring the immune system back down, calm it down if things are running too hot, a.k.a. we're dealing with some autoimmunity. We need things that are intelligent. Many drugs out there that are pushed through pharmaceutical companies, though they mean well, they push your immune system in one direction, and that can really mess things up on the back end, you know, leading to AKA side effects. So to avoid that, getting some natural immunoregulators are going to be a powerful thing you add into your life. How I do that, and it's been a consistent basis pretty much every single day for the past three months now, I've been using every day and even had it this morning, the incredible mushroom elixirs from Four Sigmatic. So head over to foursigmatic.com forward slash model. So that's F O R S I G. M-A-T-I-C dot com forward slash model and you're going to get 10% off all of these amazing superfood elixirs. My favorite is the Chaga and Chaga has been clinically shown to increase your NK cell activity so your natural killer cells over 300%. It's also the most powerful antioxidant that we've ever seen in the history of humanity that humans actually consume. Powerful antioxidant, powerful anti-cancer, powerful immune system regulator. So that's what I use in the morning. I'll get some chaga and sometimes I'll have it straight or I'll blend it with some you know, hot water, some healthy fat. So this could be some ghee. This could be some grass-fed butter. This could be some coconut oil, some MCT oil, things like that. With a little bit of cinnamon, maybe some other fun medicinal herbs you can throw in there. But this has been the daily thing that I've done for the past few months. And I highly recommend you start doing the same thing. They also have the mushroom coffees. And my wife is a big fan of these. And so the mushroom coffee mix has cordyceps and chaga in there. And today she ran out. She was like, where's my, where's my coffee? You know, and she's not even, ever since we've been together, she hasn't been a coffee drinker. But this has been her daily thing. She loves the way it makes her feel. And she doesn't get some weird kind of caffeine spike and crash as well. So head over and check them out. Foursigmatic.com forward slash model for 10% off. Now back to the show. All right, we're back and we're talking with Dr. Paul Saladino and just fascinating information and research. And so many people have been saying your name the past few months, and I'm just glad to have you here on the show to talk about uh, the carnivore diet. And before the break, I brought up the subject matter, and this is huge. This is, you know, I think about Dean Ornish. I think about, you know, all these folks who are on the other end of right. the spectrum saying that Meat is the causative factor, and animal foods, right. specifically the China study, right? Right. Are these are the causative factors behind heart disease, cancer, obesity? Right. So, what are we what are we missing here in this picture? A lot. The, the, a couple of things. Let's start with an evolutionary lens. Why would something that humans have been eating eating for four million years be bad for us? Right. It's a little bit of a Know, kind of a circular question, but let's just think about it from an evolutionary perspective. We have been eating That's a good question, right? Like That's we a... have been eating meat for four to six million years plus. Like, why would this be bad for us? 
this, as we talked about in the first part of this podcast, this is really what made us human. The nutrients in meat we know allowed our brains to grow, allowed us to thrive, and are clearly more bioavailable and present than they are in plant foods. That's really not debatable. Um, so why would something like this be bad for us? And the answer is that it's not bad for us, but we're, we're often confused by epidemiology studies. So I've done a number of debates with vegans or gotten into these sort of conversations repeatedly, and I would love to talk to Dean Ornish or Joel Furman or Dr. Greger or any of these vegan pundits, right, or Joel Kahn. But at a, at a scientific level, I believe they're well-intentioned and they want to help people, but they're misled. And if you look at the evidence that they bring forward, it gets to be a little nuanced, but they can only provide epidemiology studies. And so I think that the main reason that people are so confused and just is that if you look at the type of study these physicians are suggesting as supportive of their cause, it's all epidemiology. It's not interventional. And, you know, the layperson is like a programmer or an engineer or, you know, an economist or a businesswoman or something. They're not familiar with the distinction between epidemiology and interventional medical studies, but this is what's being done. This is the wool that's being pulled down over our eyes. And I don't mean to suggest that there's really a nefarious motive here, but I think that at some level, there's a lot of misleading things happening in terms of the world of plant-based uh, thinking. So there are studies in the West, right, of Western populations that show an association, a correlation between more vegetables and longer life. But as we know, correlation is not causation. There's this great website called Spurious Correlations. Have you ever seen this? I haven't. It's just this guy, just a statistician doing funny stuff. You can make some incredibly uh, accurate correlations between the number of movies Nicolas Cage appeared in in a year and the number of violent deaths by hanging, you know, Don't. or the number of the amount of cheese consumed per capita and the number of deaths by getting tangled in the bed sheets, <laughs> you know, and on a yearly basis. Like there, you can correlate all kinds of things that don't have any causative relationship, right? And so that's what epidemiology does. It says, okay, Sean and Paul, we're gonna, we're gonna give you a study. We're gonna give you a survey. What have you eaten over the last five years? And you say, oh, I'm eating this much stuff, right? And, they, and how are your health outcomes now? But there are so many variables that doesn't account for. What is your marital status? Do you have a partner that cares about you? Are you financially well off? Do you go to the physician to get regular screening for things like colon cancer? Or breast cancer? Do you exercise, right? That's not really taken into account. They try, but they can't really do that. And what we tend to see because of what we've been told, what's the narrative that we've been told for the last 70 years within the U.S.? Meat is bad for you. Fat is bad for you. Vegetables are good for you. So who eats more vegetables? People that are doing the right thing, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. People that are exercising, they're playing tennis, they're golf, they're in the sun. If you look at the socioeconomic status of people who are eating more plants, they're higher because they're kind of listening to what's coming down from the health authorities. There's the, I need to do the right thing, right? I need to eat more salads because, and they have the ability to kind of get that information. Well, who's eating more meat? It's people who are, you know, lower socioeconomic status. They're kind of the James Dean types. Like, you know what? Hamburger's good. I'm going to eat that. And they're also eating a hamburger with bread and fries and a milkshake and a Coke. So can the survey distinguish all that? No, it can't really, right? The people who have eaten the most meat in these epidemiology surveys over the last 60 years are also the people who are eating more junk food, smoking more, they're more overweight, they're more diabetic, and they're more obese. And so of course they look like they're unhealthy. But this is the type of study that these plant-based people are pushing. And they're saying, look, there's an association here. Clearly, this should be causal. It starts to fall apart when you take any epidemiology that's not done in the Western world that doesn't have the same narrative, right? If you go to Asia, for instance, there are large epidemiology studies of more than 100,000 people. And the narrative there is different. In Asia, in Hong Kong, if you eat meat, you're like, you're doing good. You know, you're in like royalty or your meat is associated with a higher socioeconomic status in Asia. So what do we see? We see the complete opposite. But the, the plant-based folks never tell us about that. In Asia, if you look in, at all-cause mortality in Asia, the more meat you eat, the lower your all-cause mortality is. You live longer in Asia if you eat more meat. So if we take 
and jump out of the survey type of study and we look at what's actually happening right. within ourselves mm -hmm. from a biological level, is there any association with red meat, for example? No. And heart disease? No, there's not in interventional studies. So it's all epidemiology again, right? And it's all confounded by these healthy user and unhealthy user biases. But there are no interventional studies which show that red meat is inflammatory. And there are interventional studies, right? There are mm -hmm. studies in which people have eaten more red meat and the inflammatory markers don't go up, right? And there are studies in which people have been given more fiber and they don't get less cancer. They get the same amount of cancer. That's the other flip side of the coin, right? So if you look at the interventional studies with red meat, like it's, it doesn't, there's no evidence that red meat is inflammatory when we give it to humans. And why would it be, right? What's the evolutionary context? Why would red meat be inflammatory? Oh yeah, you and I are gonna go hunt a woolly mammoth and it's gonna prevent us from being healthy beings to pass on our genes. That gene is gonna get called out 4 million years ago, right? Like there's, it doesn't make any sense. And that's what people have lost. I would challenge Dean Ornish or Michael Greger or Joel Furman to come in the woods with me and actually understand what it's like to live in the woods because these guys are just living in a fairy tale world. There, there are not enough plants in the woods to have sustained us for the last 4 million years. And that's what's written in our genome. Mm -hmm. And it could, a different story could have been written, but that's just the story that, that we have today. Yeah. You just said something I don't want to pass over uh, in relationship to heart disease. Like when you asked your dad right. about that, you know, what causes it, right. you just said inflammation several times. Right. So talk a little bit about that. So this is a, a really cool topic. Um, one of the things people worry about when they eat more animals is that their LDL cholesterol is gonna go up. And this really pulls us down into the weeds, but I'll try and make it clear for people. I have a lot of good friends now who are cardiologists and we all lament this hyper myopic focus on LDL cholesterol as the only indicator of cardiovascular risk. It's just not a good predictor. And so it is true that in many people, if you eat more saturated fat, like our ancestors would have done for the last 4 million years, your LDL may go up. But if you eat more saturated fat in the form of animal foods at the exclusion of insulin resistance promoting processed carbohydrates, you will lose weight, your diabetes will get better, and you will become more insulin sensitive. And your other markers uh, on your lipid panel will get to be much better. But unfortunately, most in the medical community only look at LDL. They won't look at triglyceride to HDL ratio. They won't look at inflammatory markers, and they definitely won't look at fasting insulin and measures of insulin sensitivity. What we see when we really dig into the equation with LDL is that LDL is necessary for atherosclerosis, but not sufficient to cause it on its own. To make the argument that native LDL, low-density lipoprotein, causes atherosclerosis on its own is to take a very tenuous position that is not supported by the science. LDL is involved, but it does not initiate atherosclerosis. And so there's another variable there that everyone mm -hmm. is missing. Mm -hmm. And that variable is insulin resistance. It's not about how much LDL is in your blood. It's about how much LDL gets stuck in your arterial wall. And that relationship is not linear. There are tons of studies that show the same number of people have heart attacks with an LDL of 90 milligrams per deciliter as 170 milligrams per deciliter. There's, it's not a good predictor. So why is there no dose response relationship between LDL and heart attacks if we accept the prevailing hypothesis that the more LDL, the higher the risk? <clears throat> Furthermore, if LDL is enough to initiate atherosclerosis, why don't we get atherosclerosis in veins? Atherosclerosis only occurs in arteries, which are high pressure, and probably because of the high pressure, damages the endothelium more. The endothelium is the inner cell layer of our arteries. It has a very uh, delicate layer of glycoproteins called the glycocalyx, which protrudes from it and is kind of waving in the flow of the arteries. And so in higher turbulence areas, that glycocalyx can get damaged a little bit. And if the LDL is, uh, if there's inflammation and insulin resistance, then the LDL will come into the arterial wall. But in the absence of inflammation, in the absence of insulin resistance, doesn't matter how much LDL you have in your arteries, it won't come into your arteries. And we know that LDL is beneficial. This is another fascinating point that I talk about in my book. Nobody ever talks about the fact that LDL is a carrier for cholesterol, but LDL also has immunologic roles in the human body. It protects us from bacterial infection. 
people that have higher levels of LDL are protected from bacterial infection as they age. And then we come back to this fascinating evolutionary lens. Why would evolution have designed us to have something in our bodies that is good for us, that protects us against bacterial invasion, and is also killing us? <laughs> it doesn't make any sense, right? It's, there's clearly the other, there's another piece of the equation, and that piece of the equation is, it's not about how much LDL you have, it's about how, many, how much LDL gets stuck. And insulin resistance and inflammation are what make LDL sticky and your arteries sticky. And that's why we don't get atherosclerosis in our veins, because we need a little bit of damage in our arteries to initiate the movement of LDL into the arterial wall. And inflammation is the beginning of that, and turbulence is the beginning of that. But LDL itself is not enough. So the take home here is meat and heart disease, are we looking at epidemiology studies? Probably. If we're looking at mechanistic studies, LDL will rise. But like I said, there are so many amazing studies that show that as we age, higher levels of LDL are protective. So the story has clearly just not been fully elaborated for us, and it's quite fascinating. Um, I, I take great pride in the fact that my LDL is robustly high and uh, that that is serving immune roles and delivering cholesterol to my testicles to make testosterone yeah. and delivering cholesterol to my skin and, you know, gives me the building blocks of steroid hormones. Yeah, vitamin D3. Yeah. Vitamin D3 while I am insulin sensitive because I can check my fasting insulin and my HDL is also very high and my triglycerides are very low. But if I went to a traditional doctor, they would look at this and fall out of their seat, completely missing the fact that my HDL is 95 and my triglycerides are 46. You know, yeah. like show me someone like I just don't believe that with that amount of insulin sensitivity, any human is going to develop yeah. atherosclerosis. You seem very healthy, but you'd be on a statin. I would, I would be, I would, and in a, so, in a paternal 1984 society, I would be on a statin in a heartbeat. And that statin would uh, limit my ability to produce testosterone. It would inhibit all the other things that I'm doing with increase cholesterol. your insulin resistance? It probably, it would increase my insulin resistance <laughs> yeah. by affecting the mitochondria. It would affect the production of cholesterol in my brain. It might predispose me to dementia later on. It would do all these bad things when, in fact, if we have a risk of carter, coronary artery disease, we just need to make sure that we are insulin sensitive. Yeah. This is fascinating and just really uh, important things for us to consider. That angle about the, the veins, like, right. I never thought about right. that before. That's really, really interesting. Uh, the, there's so many things I want to ask you about, but uh, the, the final topic that I want to make sure to cover, and this is what immediately comes up for uh especially in the, in the health space, you know, people who are um, adamant about the consumption of fibrous, specific, specifically mm -hmm. fibrous vegetables, right. fibrous foods. Right. And what the hell, you know? So w what about that? What about this angle with fiber? We, are we getting any from animal foods? Or, you know, is that, is that the question to ask? Or are we missing the point? Do we not need fiber like we've been taught? Yeah, this is, again, I love it. So many great rabbit holes here. The fiber discussion um, often segues into cancer, diverticulosis, and the microbiome. So we can talk about all of those specifically, or constipation. The main question I get from people is, how am I going to poop on the carnivore diet? And I want to be like, I'm going to send you a picture of my poop every morning. I'm going to prove to you that you can have beautiful, easy to pass stools on the carnivore diet. So if we're talking about constipation and you look at the medical literature, this is not debatable. There is no evidence that fiber improves constipation. In fact, fiber fails miserably to affect constipation. Fiber does not increase the ease of stool passage. It does not decrease the pain, does not increase bleeding. It can increase stool volume. It often makes stools more painful to pass because they're bigger. But people with constipation continue to have symptoms on diets, including more fiber. They just have bigger stools. So they might have more poop, but it's still painful, and they have to use laxatives to the same extent. So there's no evidence that fiber improves constipation. And there is evidence to the contrary that the removal of fiber in one study resulted in complete resolution of idiopathic constipation in a, in a trial. So they, this is a fascinating trial. They had three groups. It was about 60 people, about 20 people in each group. And all the people in the group had idiopathic constipation. So they, they had constipation that the, doc, the gastroenterologists were like, we don't know what's causing this. That's idiopathic. One group ate diet as normal. One group ate reduced fiber. And one group ate zero fiber. Zero fiber. 
the group with zero fiber, 100% of them completely resolved idiopathic constipation within four weeks. 100%. They all resolved constipation. So a lot of constipation, I believe, is caused by fiber, whether it's fiber feeding methane producing organisms in the gut or fiber triggering other problems in the gut. If someone is listening to this and they have constipation, remove fiber and watch what happens. I can't even tell you how many people I've worked with who have removed plant fiber from their diet and seen complete resolution of GI symptoms, whether it was diarrhea or constipation. So IBS, you know, irritable bowel syndrome, remove fiber and see what happens. Like people will be amazed. On this the is like this right? is like when you get that picture on social media of like what color is it <laughs> and like this is like the whole and somebody would just blow your mind saying the opposite thing like we just had this picture of this shoe have you seen the shoe no one? and the shoe is clearly pink and white and my wife is like oh it's gray and blue and i'm just like clearly there's something wrong with your medulla oblongata <laughs> right but it, this is like so counter what we have been taught and to hear a statement like that that's but here's my thing and this is something that I know, you know, we, we are still learning so much about it. And right. also I know that you still have a lot to learn about this subject right. too in relationship to fiber is what's going on with the microbiome. And if we look at some of the data with, you know, traditional hunter gatherer tribes and what's happening with their microbiome and the diversity. And so one of the first things that comes up for me is what about the scaphas, right? Short chain fatty acids. Yeah, yeah. let's talk about yeah. it. Yeah. So let's talk about diversity first. Ketogenic diets do not change alpha diversity. Um, and fiber also does not increase alpha diversity. So alpha diversity is a measure of how diverse any, any defined ecosystem is. There's alpha diversity, beta diversity, gamma diversity, whatever. But alpha diversity is one of these metrics that's held up for the gut. And they say, oh, the more diversity, the better. It's an oversimplification because you can have tons of gram-negative anaerobes, tons of proteobacter running around your gut and have a lot of diversity. You just have a lot of criminals, right? Having said that, what we see is that when people remove fiber, the alpha diversity doesn't change at all. And when people add fiber, the alpha diversity does not increase. And so this is, this is published studies on people, on kids on like high-fat ketogenic diets, which have very little fiber, alpha diversity doesn't change. Adding fiber isn't going to increase your alpha diversity. So the alpha diversity story is really wrong. You can't change your alpha diversity with fiber, not fiber. That doesn't affect it. In terms of a gut microbiome, I, I love talking about this. I want to talk about it more because more and more people are criticizing a carnivore diet for this unjustly. No one knows what a healthy microbiome is. The microbiome that you have when you are healthy is a healthy microbiome. Everyone is trying to say, oh, if you increase the fiber, you'll see an increase in lactobacillus and bifidobacteria. Therefore, if you decrease the fiber, you're going to have an unhealthy microbiome. This is about 20 steps too premature. I can't even tell you the number of people I've seen and worked with who have had resolution of inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's and ulcerative colitis on a carnivore diet by eliminating fiber. So if anyone wants to make an argument to me that their microbiome is getting worse as their chronic debilitating autoimmune inflammatory bowel disease is being resolved, that's a pretty tough argument to make, right? And the number of people that have had resolution in gas, bloating, constipation, diarrhea, and abdominal pain by removing fiber, it's hard to make an argument their microbiome is getting worse, right? It's... To me, it's, it's, again, it's myopic science being done by people who are saying, we know what a healthy microbiome is. You need bifido, you need acromantia, you need fecobacterium prasnusiae, you need roseburia. And sure, probably should have those, those bacteria in there. But if we look at the Hadza, the Hadza don't really have any bifido bacteria in there. You mm -hmm. know, like, so what's a healthy microbiome? Yeah. And I would argue that the microbiome is something we should be looking at, but we shouldn't be putting all of our eggs in that basket. What we should be doing is saying, are you having malabsorption? What's the steatocrit, which is a measure of malabsorption in your gut? What's your pancreatic elast elastase? What about calprotectin? What about zonulin? Stool zonulin is maybe not the best measure, but we should. there are other measures of gut health, right? Yeah. So we can look at the bacteria in your gut, but I can also go into your gut uh, figuratively, not literally, and, and say how much inflammation is in your gut. I can look at calprotectin. I can look at 
a PEG 400 test and tell you how leaky your gut is, or I can do a lactulose mannitol test and tell you how leaky your gut is, or I can use stool zonulin as a measure of that. That's what we should be doing. And so I think we should have these conversations, but clinically what I've seen and all the literature points to the fact that removing fiber makes all those measures better. Wow, fascinating. So this was, I prefaced this question with, we still have a lot to learn. Right. And you just reiterated that. Yeah. And figure out what does that actually look like with the healthy microbiome. And we've got just one more minute. So quick question. All right. Scaphas, short chain fatty acid. Yeah, acids. let's talk about it. So the main short chain fatty acid that people think about is butyrate. But there's also propionate, isobutyrate, valerate, acetate. And you can make all of those from protein just fine. There's also a very, very fascinating paper done in cheetahs that shows that collagen can act just like plant fiber and be metabolized into short chain fatty acids as well. So this gets back to the nose to tail eating of animals saying that if you are eating the connective tissue of an animal like our ancestors would have done, there's plenty of animal fiber in there. So that's probably the, the ultimate like, well, case closed, you know, like there are plenty of there are plenty of foods that we can make into short chain fatty acids that are not plants. So anyone that's saying you need butyrate, you need this from plants, like that's just not true. There have actually been studies done comparing veg and plant based diets and carnivore diets and looking at the amount of short chain fatty acids and the carnivore diet. You still make short chain fatty acids. You make different short chain fatty acids, but the colonic epithelial cells, which rely on those short chain fatty acids can use whatever. They can use isobutyrate just as well as butyrate. So quick question I'm going to throw in here. Yeah. just popped up in my mind. Uh, and I saw this, I think it was yesterday, a study, US, USC, um, looking at helping to escort out uh, recirculating estrogens. Right. Right? So what about that? Can, can animal products do that too? Oh, this is plant foods that were doing that? Yeah. Well, the question is, why are the, why are the elevated estrogens there in the first place? Why are we recirculating them in the first place? See, you, you keep baking the noodle, man. That's good. <laughs> why yeah. is it there in the first place? Generally, what you think of when you look at a gut test, whether it's a GI map or something, you'll look at something called beta-glucuronidase, which is a compound produced by bacteria, and it's also produced in the liver. And if somebody has a high level of beta-glucuronidase, we might think they have dysbiosis or the wrong type of bacteria. And that beta-glucuronidase can do like its name suggests. It can cleave glucuronide from molecules that our body's trying to get rid of, like estrogen. So the question is, if somebody is recirculating estrogen, they probably have dysbiosis and their gut probably has the wrong type of bacteria. So we'll know, like, like I said, we don't know what a healthy gut microbiome is, but we know what an unhealthy gut microbiome looks like, kind of, right? So in that case they have dysbiosis in the first place and the plants probably cause the dysbiosis. And in that case, yeah, there are other things you have to do to prevent that recirculating estrogen. In a healthy physiology, you shouldn't need anything added to get rid of excess estrogens. I love it, man. Yeah. I, I, this, this is just, for me, just fascinating. And I love the fact that you've really poured your heart and soul into the research and just picking things apart and trying to figure this stuff out. Uh, to be able to share with people. And um, like I mentioned, a lot of people are following your work and applying the things that you've been teaching at some at varying levels of, of degrees, and they're seeing great results. So uh, just huge, huge props for you, Thank you for man. that. Thank you. And also, you've got a book coming out very soon, it's so people keep an eye out for that. Yep. And But in the meantime, please let folks know where they can learn more about what you're up to, where they can connect with you online. The best place to go is carnivoremd.com. That's my website. You can find links to everything there. You can find my podcast, my Instagram, everything, carnivoremd.com. And on that, you'll find a link to my book, which is called The Carnivore Code, yeah. Unlocking the Secrets to Optimal Wellness by Returning to Our Ancestral Diet. And it'll be out December, probably. It'll, it'll be big. And the book, so the book is done. I'm in the editing phase. It's yeah. over 400 pages. I'm going to have to call it down a little yeah. bit, but there's over 300 references in the book. So yeah. all the things I'm talking about here, all the studies I'm referencing, every single one of those is in the book. Awesome. Yeah. Man, th again, thank you for just having the audacity to kind of be the, the face <laughs> of this and to, to, to put so much study and research into making this make sense for people. It's, it's really awesome. Man, man thank I'm you. so grateful to be able to do it. I'm, I'm blessed, you know, like I, I feel like I'm in the right place and it's been a fun journey. And as you see, we've covered so much in this podcast. 
And it's been so interesting and fun to dig back in the lipids from medical school and look at gut flora and look at diverticulosis and cancer and heart disease. It's a whole huge thing. We didn't even talk about the environmental stuff today. That's a whole nother thing. But it's been it's been my pleasure, and I'm just I'm blessed to be able to talk about it. I'm grateful to contribute to the community. Awesome. I'm grateful for having you today, man. Thanks, thank man. you. Yeah. Everybody, thank you so much for tuning into the show today. I hope you got a lot of value out of this episode. And listen, this is about thinking bigger, thinking differently, because as he just mentioned, going back and looking at the things that he learned in medical school from a different perspective, just imagine what we can accomplish. You know, we don't want to get caught in our tunnel vision, our tunnel vision and forgetting that there's so much and the human body is so complex and amazing and we live in an amazing universe as well. And there's a code to it all, you know, just to pivot off of the title of his new book coming very soon. And uh, again, if you want to learn more about the carnivore diet and what Dr. Saladino is up to, definitely check him out on social media, pop over there to the website and pre-order the book as well. And uh, we've got some powerhouse episodes coming your way very, very soon. So make sure to stay tuned. Make sure to share this out with your friends and family on social media. And of course, you could tag me, you could tag him and let everybody know what you thought of the episode. And again, stay tuned. We've got some powerhouse stuff coming your way. Take care, have an amazing day, and I'll talk with you soon. Hey.